Hi folks, my name is Dan Carson. I am a writer based right here in East Belfast. I would really, really, really love to be doing this reading from the Strand tonight. If I stick my head out my door, I can probably see the Strand from my front door, but unfortunately I can't be there in person this evening. What I'd love to do is share with you a little bit of my work and tell you about what I'm working on at the minute and hopefully you'll enjoy that. So for the last few years, actually since 2015, I have been working in a genre called microfiction. Microfiction is really just tiny little stories that come in round about 250-300 words for me. I like to write microfiction on the back of postcards. I find they fit really neatly in the little space and I like them to send them out to people. Um, over the last six years now I have sent nearly a thousand pieces of microfiction around the world which sounds a bit mad when you say it um, and I thought I'd begin by reading you a few of my um, pieces that I like, wrote quite some time ago. Um, I actually released a collection of these um, in 2017 in the Strand, it was a fantastic evening and I thought I'd begin by reading you one um, about Belfast and maybe what I'm missing at the minute since I can't get out to the, the venues and clubs I really love. This morning I read that K. Ryan poem, the one about the fourth wise man who disliked travel and preferred his own bed to the open road, which made me think of the shepherd who went off for a quick wee at exactly the wrong angelic moment, and all the people who, upon hearing there was only one portion of loaves and fish to split between so many, went home to fix their own sandwiches and the guests who drank themselves blind beneath the tables long before the water turned wineish, and of course the disciples, who were almost always asleep in boat bottoms and gardens and other comfortable spots, missing the point of everything. And finally I arrived at myself, and the very many times I have decided to stay in, watching reruns of Morse and Poirot, reading paperback novels in bed, whilst in the streets and bars and stage rooms of this city, miracles are miracling away, and I'm only afterwards hearing about them on Facebook. I'm sure you can probably resonate with that today. Um, I think we're all desperately missing our venues and our live arts at the minute. Um, I actually have another collection of postcard stories coming out really soon in July. Um, haven't got the cover yet, but if you can picture this, but red instead of blue, you've pretty much nailed it. Um, and I, I should say that there are beautiful illustrations in this book by Benjamin Phillips, like this one, and there will be in the next book as well. So I thought I'd give you a little sneaky peek of two stories that are going to be in the next collection and you are the first people to hear these. So the first one is, um, I actually wrote two postcard stories about my grandmothers um, and this is um, one from my father's mother whose name was Agnes. Your father's mother was Agnes. She came from a rural townland, oil all vials and phlegm to say. Her home house was a series of small boxes stacked one upon the other, a neat and God-fearing establishment, with nothing in the way of a show. So many weans went through that wee house, they ran out of good Protestant names to give them, so the last was called after the first, who died young, of something you could cure with antibiotics now. Your granny was a weaver of linen, no different from all the other Agnes's tendon loom in Lisburn, Belfast and Portadown. She took her lunch in her hand each morning and walked a dark mile there and back. She did not see herself party to something significant, yet each morning she took the raw yarn in her hands and though it was as old ladies' hair or horse tails caught up in knots, saw only what it could be, a handkerchief a Sunday shirt, a finely embroidered tablecloth paling over a big house table. She lifted her shuttle and wove the future into each tangled strand and did not stop till the mills began falling down around her. Picture your granny, every day from eight till six, first in Ross's factory, age 13, all the way up to the age you are now, then later in the phoenix, which was further to walk, but more money. Picture her lame in the foot from a dropped shuttle. Picture her wearing her retirement watch to church, hiking her sleeve up to show the gold of it off. Picture ten thousand women like her, spinning, weaving and stitching, leaning against mill walls smugging. Tell yourself there was nothing remarkable about your granny, and this is why you never asked. 
Um, the second story from the new collection that I'd like to share is one called Halloween um, and it comes from a kind of lost period in my life where I was a, a youth worker for, for small children in a church and it probably wasn't um, the, the perfect role for me but um, this is lifted from an incident that actually happened. Halloween. The church does not want its children to feel left out but it cannot possibly condone a Halloween party. It considers hosting a harvest party. However, this is not America. It is a spell fest. The people here have no real appetite for pumpkin-based products. Eventually, the church decides to organise a fancy dress party. Every child will come dressed as a Bible character. There will be diluting juice in polystyrene cups, what sits in a bowl, and when things really get going, musical chairs. Four boys come as Joseph. They wear stripy bathrobes in blue-grey tones. There are two Marys, a Samson in his grandmother's wig, Moses, Solomon and a handful of wise men sporting cardboard crowns. One child comes as Satan. He's definitely in the Bible, she argues at the door. She is wearing a red jumpsuit, horns and a tail. She is going on to another proper Halloween party after the church one. She does not understand why the minister will not let her take her anorak off. Um, I hope you enjoyed that one. Every time I read it, it gives me a wee laugh. And there's a fantastic illustration that's coming with it. I um, wanted to tell you a little bit about what goes into a postcard story before I just read you a few more to finish. Um, they're very, very simple. Um, you're just looking at an ordinary postcard like these, blank space on the back. Um, you can actually buy these in a box, so I quite often order them off the internet. I've got some lovely Roald Dahl ones here. Um, and what you do is you write extremely tiny on the back. You can see how small my handwriting has got. Um, what that looks like, that's about 300 words. And just to give you an idea of it, I usually write them beforehand in my notebook. And this is about a page fits onto the back of a postcard. Um, so if I'm coming to sit down to write a postcard story, I usually, all day, I'm looking for an idea. Something that kind of captures my attention. It could be a overheard snippet of conversation or something I see when I'm out for my walk in the park. And I mull over that. And sometimes I find the best postcard stories come from putting a strange idea into your normal life. So I've written some recently about the rats, which I keep seeing in Victoria Park and bringing them in to have dinner with me because I'm quite lonely stuck here at the minute. Or I've written about, you know, what what's a Loch Ness Monster doing at the minute during lockdown? So taking a kind of strange abstract concept and putting it into your normal world often generates an idea for a story. But even if you're not feeling particularly creative, postcards are still a great way to connect with people. For the price of a second class stamp, you can pop something in the post and your friend across the city or somewhere else in the world can think for a minute someone else is thinking about me. So it might just be that you write a little note about what's going on in your day or share a memory that you have with the person you're sending to. Or I got a lovely one there. You can actually see behind me with the waterfall. Um, a friend in America wrote a poem on the back of a postcard, um, a piece of E.E. E. Cummings poetry. So not even your own poetry, just something that you've lifted from somewhere else. It's really important to keep connected at the minute. And postcards, I find, are really cheap, quick easy way to make somebody feel special when the postman pops it through the letterbox. Since the lockdown happened I have been writing a postcard story every day and I have been sending them out to older isolated people all over the UK. Um, I've done nearly 50 so far and I have been ably helped by a whole trip of fantastic children who are illustrating these. I post them every day on a little Instagram account, um, Jan's Postcard Stories. So if you're on Instagram, you can follow along there with the kids' wonderful, wonderful pictures. Um, and I thought I'd just read you a few of these to finish off. They're mostly pretty upbeat, funny, humorous, trying to bring a little bit of cheer into people's worlds at the minute. So let's see, what will we start with? Swimming lessons. I have decided to use my time indoors profitably. For the next few weeks, I will be taking nightly swimming lessons. I hope to be reasonably proficient by the time the lockdown ends. 
Each evening at 7pm I don my swimsuit, goggles and cap and put my swimming instructor on speakerphone. Then I climb into my bathtub, lie on my belly in half a foot of lukewarm water and follow his instructions carefully. When he says, move your arms in semicircular motions, I imagine my arms making wide, swooping arcs through the cool blue water. When he says, kick your legs out, I imagine my legs kicking wildly, leaving white froth in my wake. When he says, raise your head above the waterline and breathe deeply, I raise my head and breathe in so deeply I can imagine the chlorine smell swimming all the way up my nose. After half an hour, my swimming lesson ends. Well done, my instructor always says. I think we made significant progress tonight. And I have to agree, though I haven't shifted so much as an inch up the bathtub. In my imagination, I have been skimming through the ocean waves like a dolphin or something equally sleek and free. Um, here it's one about... Um, chickens. So I don't know if you remember, but back at the start of the lockdown, there was a bit of a run on chickens. Everyone was trying to get a source for their own fresh eggs each day. Chicken. Mammy says we should get ourselves a chicken. Then we'd have a constant supply of free eggs. Daddy says everybody's trying to get their hands on a chicken these days. There's not one to be had for love nor money in the whole of Belfast. Last year in school we learned that chickens come from eggs. All you have to do is keep the egg warm and after a few weeks out pops a wee yellow chick. This morning I lifted an egg from Mammy's baking cupboard. I've been carrying it around all day, really carefully. I have it tucked into my armpit. It's warm in there, just what you need for hatching chicks. I've been standing funny all day just to make sure I don't smash it. I can't play football or ride my bike. I even had to lie when Daddy asked me what was wrong with my arm. Why I was holding it at a funny angle. I told him I'd bumped it off the fridge door. I know it's wrong to tell lies. Daddy would be cross if he knew. It'll be worth it though in two weeks time when the wee baby hen pops out the end of my jumper sleeve and we have free eggs every day. Daddy will understand then. He'll see how clever I am. And I will finish with this one, which if you're struggling with homeschooling your children at the minute, this one might be um, just a ticket for you. It's called Statues. I'll be honest with you, I lost my temper with the children. It isn't easy, you know, keeping up with my own job, homeschooling the pair of them, putting the food on the table three times a day and making sure the house doesn't disappear beneath a mountain of laundry. This morning, when my youngest started moaning that she didn't want Weetabix for breakfast again, I snapped. Right, that's it, I said. Outside, the pair of you. Go and play in the back garden. But what will we play, Mum? whined the eldest. Without thinking, I fired back. Play statues. The one who stands still for the longest will be the winner. There might even be a prize. Cheered by the prospect of winning something, they trooped outside. My children have always been extremely competitive. I put the kettle on and enjoyed a quiet coffee in front of the telly and fell asleep and woke three hours later to the horrifying realisation that my children had been standing perfectly still in the back garden all this time. I went out to check on them. Both were damp from the drizzle and a magpie had begun to build a nest in the youngest's hair. They were not as traumatised as I'd expected. Wondered then if I might get away with another round of statues tomorrow. So I hope you enjoyed those wee readings. Um, they're not too heavy and um, hopefully give you a smile as well. I am really looking forward to be back with you in real life. Um, hopefully not to, not too far from now. Um, in the meantime, keep reading and keep connecting every way you can. And just if you're looking for something to think about sending a postcard. It's a really lovely way to cheer someone up. It's been really nice to spend some time with you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye!